Hi, and welcome back to The Couch and the Discovery Doc Podcast. Here today with Dr. Cece. We're going to go over her birth story of her three beautiful, gorgeous Munchkins. babies. They're absolutely incredible. So strong. That Jada. Oh, goodness. Listen. <laughs> We're also going to talk about how you can have access to resources and advocate for your own children in well care visits. And she's going to go over kind of how you can do that. Um, And then if we need to get into functional medicine, what that looks like and having a practitioner that you can ask those questions to and know all of those things. So let's just get into it. Yeah, here we go. Here Here we we go. go. Let's go. Let's discover together. (laughs) So a big part, and we kind of mentioned this in the first the first episode, Anna Kate over here asked how I felt like my journey with Lyme disease impacted my pregnancies and just as a mom. And I kind of answered the, the mom aspect of it, but not the pregnancy aspect. And I've had three wildly different pregnancies and births that I think it really speaks volumes to when you get your body to a point where you feel optimal. Mm-hmm. Holy moly, how much better pregnancy can be. And that is so, I Isn't know. Isn't that that thing with anything? The more optimal <laughs> yes. you are, the better life is? The better it feels. Um, and, and I just think that so not enough women are focused on improving their health prior to conceiving to really give themselves the best chance at the healthiest and just most successful pregnancy. So for me to kind of go through it, Ava, she's seven now. She was my first baby. And with her, I had pregnancy-induced cholestasis that came about at 37 weeks. And previous to that healthy pregnancy, nothing abnormal. So for those Um, of us that don't know what cholestasis is. Yes. Good question. That's a big word. It is a big word. And actually, I think I lied. It was was 36 weeks that I was diagnosed with it. So pregnancy-induced cholestasis is basically when your your liver cannot break down bile that is being excreted. From your gallbladder. Exactly. And hey, I know that was good. <laughs> um, and so rather than filtering out through the body and you excreting it or it being recycled, it builds up in your body. And when it builds up and it has nowhere to go, the main symptom is intense itching. It's miserable. Nothing topical can help um, at all because it's it's happening internally, right? It's it's inside out. And so the itching is just a result of what's going on internally. And therefore you, you cannot do anything topical. And I had, I mean, I had bruises from how bad I would itch, oh, like God. linear lines going down my arms on my inner thighs was a really big one to the point where my midwife was like, are you safe? You know, are you being abused? And I would show her pictures to, to prove like, no, this is from like something's happening with my body. And at that point, I didn't know what it was. I did all the research after that and kind of self-diagnosed with cholestasis. And it turned out to be to be correct. But ultimately, in conventional medicine, there's nothing that can be done. <laughs> surprise, and surprise. Then, yeah. And you were in your allopathic field at this time. I was not working yet. I was in school. Okay. So yeah, I was I was in the midst of school. Um, pregnant in in the last semester of one of my programs. And it was a mixture of holy moly, I'm going to give birth in in my last semester in the midst of it, like in it was March, you know, that I was due and the semester wasn't over until May. Um, And this cholestasis popped up and I was being told, well, you have it, there's nothing that can be done, we'll monitor your liver enzymes. And towards the end, so over the next week, my liver enzymes doubled. And they were really high, the itching, I mean, all night, all night, all day, there's no relief from this itching. And I have been in pain chronically. And I have experienced that itching, and I would choose the pain any day, because there's something about the itching, like pain, I could mentally get through and Mm -hmm. work through. And maybe it's just because I was more used to it, chronically. But itching, I, it, it sounds weird, but there's like mentally, it really messed me up. Mm-hmm. Um, so towards the end, they gave me a drug that was supposed to calm your liver enzymes down. It didn't work. So Ava also was breached. Her head was up here right under my right rib cage. And we tried everything. I mean, I went to chiropractic. I went to acupuncture and I was on my own accord. 
Um, we even tried a version where they physically mm -hmm. tried to, you know, manipulate the baby to she would not flip. Holy moly, that was very painful. Um, they give you a muscle relaxant and they physically, you know, the physician took his hands and physically tried to outwardly move her and she would get halfway and, you know, transverse across the mm -hmm. side of my belly. And the doctor would be like, okay, I think this is it. And then she would just pop back up. <laughs> and so we, we tried everything. So then she ended up being a forced, I say forced, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. C-section at 38 weeks because they were like, your liver enzymes are too high. This could hurt the baby. Um, we need to take her. So, so of all your three children, is Ava the most strong-willed? No, Jada is. The, the youngest, <laughs> the youngest. Yeah, the youngest is. We'll get into that. Um, no, Ava is my, like, she's my old soul. Like, I've been here before. She is, like, just so in tune and smart and an amazing human. But um, the, the cholestasis after birth resolved. Mm -hmm. And... After birth, I think, I mean, at that point in time, I was struggling with Lyme disease and I didn't know it. So postpartum was terrible. I mean, yeah. I had very severe postpartum depression, um, like very severe. Like I, I remember, I've never said this to anybody, only Will knows this. Well, you're about to put it out for everybody <laughs> I am, but I think it's important. But I remember sitting upstairs in our townhouse, sitting on the floor with will's firearm just sitting there sobbing and i don't remember feeling like i wanted to use it but my the fact that my brain went there to to grab it yeah. it was intense postpartum depression and i didn't know what that was nobody i mean i was 25 years old nobody talked to you about that mm -hmm. and i went to a midwife i was you know i was working with a midwife in florida who you know by nature i think midwives are and this is um, there are different midwives this was not a certified nurse mid well what they, like cnm is different um this was an actual nurse practitioner mm -hmm. um and not once was it like talked about or you know really did i feel like screened for like you can lie there's a one little questionnaire that you fill out in the lobby like of course i want to say i'm doing fine um and it was bad and i wasn't producing milk i, I pumped every two hours for 30 minutes and got like half an ounce and it just my body wasn't working right. and I had no support I had no nobody telling me like hey this is how you can help heal your body after giving birth this is what you need with your healing from a major surgery with a c-section yeah like here's what you can do nothing so that was a rough one that was that was a rough one I felt like super disconnected um, from Ava for multiple reasons because I struggled postpartum, but also because of Lyme. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jack Jack. So fast forward to Jackson, which was they are two years and three months apart. And I was at the peak of of Lyme worldness, which yes, that's <laughs> deep, that, deep inhale. Yeah, that's a that's a also depressing place to be mm -hmm. as well because you don't have control over your body mm -mm. to do the things and so if if you are in this place where you feel like there's no hope please reach out to someone because there are things that yes that can i help wish and can do. yeah I, I wish i knew that there were people who had gone through what i was going through or just i wish i knew someone who could help at that time but i didn't so i yeah. just dealt with it and just kept I'm moving sorry. forward. I'm sorry. It's all good. I mean, but there is that time where, and, and part of our shared, you know, spiritual background is that there's an enemy that yes. is searching to seek and destroy. And part of that was that of, yes. well, you don't need to be here. Like you would be a less of a burden because mm -hmm. you have to go to all these doctor's appointments and you feel bad and they got to open yeah. water bottles for you and they got to do all this stuff. And I knew that that was a lie, but that didn't stop it from feeling feeling it yeah. and getting to the place well like yeah what what difference does it make if i am here mm -hmm. and this is the difference that it makes is that if you stick around god does amazing things, things. absolutely and, and puts the right people into your into yeah. your life so 100 percent, 100 percent. um so yeah going into going into jackson's and it's so interesting the difference because you know i was just taking 
like a prenatal like I was a conventional prenatal like there was I wasn't yet into more of the natural side of things or the functional world at all even mm -hmm. when I was pregnant with Jackson really it started about halfway through Jack Jack's pregnancy and then after him I was like full force onto the other side of the planet um but with Jackson that cholestasis popped up at 34 weeks so even the midwife that I had um who was amazing but even she was like you know what you had it once you're most likely to get it again there's a genetic component and boop, like can't Surprise. do much <laughs> yeah can't do much about it um so jackson he it popped up earlier at 34 weeks and same thing i mean intense intense itching and it it was miserable i mean miserable and so by 37 weeks they were like we got to, we got to take him. Yeah. Like we got to induce you. So I, I, I really respect my midwife, even in that moment for allowing me the space to have a VBAC because so many practitioners would have been like, nope, we're going for a C-section right now. You had a previous C-section. And she was like, listen, you're young, you're overall healthy. Yes, we have this cholestasis thing, but let's try to induce you so that you can have a VBAC. And I so appreciate her for that so much but anyway so 37 weeks induced um my liver enzymes were going crazy again took the medication nothing happened um i was at like the 36 hour mark after being induced and she i was kind of stuck at nine centimeters um and this is something else that i'm so thankful for with her and she came in the room and she was like, listen, we, if we don't get this baby out now, like we're going to have to get to a C-section. And she was like, so try to push <laughs> and not being 10 centimeters dilated, just being nine centimeters. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she's like, 10 centimeters is not enough either. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she's like, let's just try. And seven minutes later, Jackson, <laughs> Jackson came out to the world. So I am so thankful for her in there and just various aspects throughout that pregnancy because i do feel like she empowered me to have that v back you know to to have him vaginally what i look back on is just shoulda woulda coulda like i wish i knew then what i knew now yeah. about cholestasis um but it was right after his birth that i was diagnosed with lyme and that i was treated we got rid of it and still with him postpartum i was better it's amazing to see the difference between c-section and vaginal and how i felt mm -hmm. like i right away i felt more connected i did not get postpartum depression with him um it was i still didn't didn't produce much breast milk that stunk but those two other aspects were much better yeah. so even just the difference between having a C-section versus vaginal. Cause when I had him, it was still chemically induced, right? right. Like my body didn't go through labor. My body was forced right. to go through labor um, due to chemicals. Right. So I think that played a huge part as to why I couldn't produce a lot of breast milk, but the other two aspects were so much better. And then treated with Lyme. And then I, I get pregnant with Jada. Wait, so how long between giving birth to Jackson and going through your post part, your, mm -hmm. your post stuff, did the cholestasis resolve itself? Oh, immediately. So with like the next day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, within 12 hours. Yes. Yes. Cholestasis is dumb. It, it is. It is within 12 hours. Okay. I mean, I remember itching minimally. So when you're in labor, you're in so much pain that I wasn't paying attention to the right. itching, but the minimally after birth for both Ava and Jackson, I was a little bit itchy, like palms and, uh, and soles mm -hmm. of my feet, especially, but within 12, 24 hours gone, completely gone. So what would you do if you didn't have a gallbladder and you got cholestasis? Well, you couldn't cause I'm that bile doesn't build up. Yeah. But where, well, I guess, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's question. asking questions for the people. Yeah. <laughs> that's cause that's that where is. my brain would go is, yeah. but, and then you're not, but your liver enzymes, would be elevated because it's got to go, the fat's got to go somewhere. And if you can't, right. Right. If you can't process the fat mm -hmm. because you don't have the gallbladder, but you don't have cholestasis because you it's have a catch 22. Okay. And that's why a lot of people who have gallbladder removals can't process a lot of foods. Don't have your gallbladder removed. It is the most 
over removed unnecessary organ. <laughs> yeah, I swear. Um, try try going to see a, a, a naturopath and an integrative medicine, <laughs> functional medicine doctor before you opt for surgery on that one. Remove body parts. But, yeah. Um, so then I, it was longer between. So Ava and Jackson are closer together than Jackson and Jada. Okay. So Jackson and Jada are about three and a half years apart. So it gave me time to recover postpartum, recover from Lyme. I knew I was Lyme free. That's the difference. So looking back, I didn't know in my pregnancies with them that I had Lyme disease, but I sure did. You know, looking back on it, I know that I did. And to the point where both Ava and Jackson, before they turned three, I tested them for Lyme disease. Yeah. Ava, full blown CDC positive at three years old. And I remember being in that naturopathic <laughs> office and bawling, yeah. bawling my eyes out. And I was on the phone with Will and just crying. And they're both like, sweetie, calm down. Like, just give her SOT. It's okay. Like, we know what to do here. But it was that guilt because our blood work matched. Mm -hmm. I mean, I gave it to her. There's no doubt that I gave it to her in utero and she was a C-section baby. So don't tell me it can only be you know, tr right. transmitted vaginally. Um, gave her SOT and she's fine. Jackson, interestingly enough, totally negative. So go, you know, go, go figure, figure that one. Right. Yeah. It, it's just a crapshoot. But so kind of proceeding forward, I was in a much better place physically. Lyme was gone. I was feeling great. But I was so scared of getting cholestasis again that that's what took us longer to get pregnant was that I, we weren't trying. Yeah. I was like, I don't know, like I would love more kids, but I'm scared. I, I cannot go through that again, especially with getting it the first time at 36 weeks, the right. second time at 34 weeks. I was like, what's this time going to be 30 weeks? You know, I can't deal with it the last time we used to pregnancy. And then I'm going to have a preterm, yes. you know, delivery and like all these things go in your head where I did was, any of that happen. No, no. <laughs> um, but it, it's that fear. It's that fear. Yes. And so finally, um, I, I gave that fear to God and I said, you know what? Like this is, I, this is ridiculous and I'm even trying to make my own plan here. So let's just forget about that. And I'm just going to proceed forward without that fear and trusting that God's got my back. And let's do this. He's the master physician. Yes. Yes. Yes, he is. Um, and so then as soon as I got pregnant with Jada, I did hours and hours of research about how I can prevent cholestasis in myself. There is no protocol out there. There is no, I mean, I spoke to so many naturopathic physicians and DOs and even MDs and nobody, nobody gave me a protocol. Nobody said, Hey, if you do this, you know, it was all yes, general liver support. Um, but I spent so long researching and I put together my own protocol, my own. Yes, <laughs> I know um, where I took, I mean, it's probably seven or eight supplements, all natural supplements, all safe in pregnancy. And I avoided freaking cholestasis in yes. Jada's pregnancy. I know. And I was just so like, one, it's a testament to how much I've learned as a practitioner Two, how much I've learned about my body. Mm -hmm. And three, the fact that when doctors out there tell you that there's nothing that can be done, I promise you, there is always, always something that can be done. And it may not eradicate what's going on, but it can absolutely make it better. Yeah. So I put, I put together that protocol. I took those supplements my entire pregnancy and did not get cholestasis, had Jada at home. Yes. <laughs> Had her at home. She's so cute. With an amazing midwife. Um, had a water birth. And she, I mean, it it is wild. It is night and day. My pregnancy was perfect. Nothing abnormal whatsoever. Birth was amazing. Postpartum was amazing. There was no you know, influx of, you know, we get all, we always get these influx of hormones and things. Mm -hmm. And like that didn't happen where it made me feel a certain way physically or, mm -hmm. you know, mentally or emotionally. I produced more breast milk than I've, I mean, I stocked up like 200 ounces in the freezer 
Like that is never, I've never had a stash. I hope you made breast milk soap or something. <laughs> I didn't, but I should have, I know. Um, and I like, I, I mean, I actually had enough with Ava and Jackson. I had a supplement with formula from the beginning because I was getting, you know, half a freaking ounce. Yeah. Well, your body was stressed from the Lyme, yes. not knowing that it was the Lyme, and that triggers all these weird yeah. things, medical yeah. mystery over here. Like, I don't, I would not know how to deal with everything and then have that show up because there's no, there's nothing to there's do. There's no room. Yeah. What do you do with it? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, we can't do anything for it. So yeah. good luck. Right. It'll clear up in 12 to 24 hours after, after that's you not, deliver. So, yeah. yeah. Birthing a baby is not the solution for this. There's got to be that exactly, other support. And so exactly. That you went and asked the questions and found the information and developed a protocol that worked for you. And you worked yeah. through all of your pregnancies. How was that different? Between... Oh my gosh. It was, yeah, it, night and day because I was in with Ava and Jackson. I was doing clinical rotations with both of them still and then working part time. And I remember like being in patients' rooms, like going like this, like itching. And the doctor would turn and be like, and I'm like, I can't, can't. help it. Like, I can't help it. And I left, I'll never forget this with um, Jackson. I left a clinical rotation and this awesome pediatrician, this, like he was probably 75 years old, like just this great doctor, but very conventional practice that I was in in South Florida. And I left, he gave me the biggest hug for no reason. And I went to my, those, whatever the 30, six week appointment mm -hmm. um, with my midwife and I get into her office and she goes, you need to go to the hospital right now because in the span of 24 hours, my liver enzymes jumped like 40 points. Goodness. It was wild. So yes, working our clinical with that versus Jada was different. I mean, I worked up until 40 weeks with Jada and in a high stress environment where I'm seeing tons of patients yep. in a day. Um, and even with that stress, I was able to avoid it. And then the postpartum was just worlds beyond. I mean, it was just so much better. It was just so much better than I experienced with Ava and Jackson. And she is my little fighter. She is like this pit bull. She is something else. She's so, she's what, a year, she's, two years? Mm, two? She'll be two in October. So what is she, a year and over, a little oh, over a year and a half? Yeah. And this chick is strong. I mean, she's, she's got, trying to keep up with her older brother and sister. She's who got are, back muscles, like yeah. literally shoulder yeah. muscles. <laughs> like what? Yes. And she is so smart. But it the, the other difference that I saw is right like at the newborn phase, like right mm -hmm. after they're born, she was so much more alert with being born at home without drugs. I mean, that chick was on my chest, like lifting up her head, eyes bright. Strong. We told you she's yes. strong from the get-go whereas the two that i had in the hospital slept you yeah. know just like it was exhausting mm -hmm. and from the drugs too you know more lethargic and just yeah. like not as aware and awake and alert um it, yeah it's just crazy to to see the difference between them all three yeah and they're same parents same mm -hmm. but, but just watching them and also jade is trying to keep up and she's watching yeah. well she watches like it's incredible she watches her older brother and sister and sees what they do and then goes and tries it she's yes. not even two yeah and they're like, she's hanging from ava's gymnastics bar and doing like toe touches where her toes touch the bar uh -huh. and i'm just like i couldn't even do that like what yeah. where yeah. are these apps coming from and i mean it's just incredible how she's watching them and how they're watching her as protective and mm -hmm. showing her and helping support in a way that's not like you stepping in and say, oh, don't hurt yourself. It's them like, hey, you can do this. Like, oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. I mean, so, so stinking smart. She is. So, so tell me how, and you can kind of do this with your own kids. So once they're newborns and then like APGAR and kind of all mm -hmm. of that stuff and making sure that that's, that score is high. Is it high or mm -hmm. low? High. high. Yeah, we want a high APGAR. High is good. High is good. <laughs> um, and then what happens after you come home with baby? What's the next steps of, okay, Jada is absolutely perfect, but you had to get mm -hmm. Ava into some well care and functional yeah. medicine after that because of the blood work and all of that and not knowing the Lyme and, knowing, and now knowing. So how do you navigate? Is it just well care or mm -hmm. how do I ask? I am my child's care. <laughs> 
I'm not going to lie. I don't take them to the doctor. Oh, um, you are. I did for, so the first six months I will, there's a couple of holistic NPs in the area that I will take them to solely within the first couple of months because newborn, I mean, when you are tired and you just gave birth and you're not, I'm not thinking objectively, right? So there can be, I don't want things to be missed. Like that would be irresponsible for me to not have other eyeballs on my kid. Um, and I'll check in like maybe once a year after that. But it is, I mean, I just think it's my responsibility as a parent to keep them healthy. Right. And so I do have, you know, the people I would go to if something were wrong that I needed more help or I needed help figuring it out or I just need another set of eyeballs. Um, but yeah, my kids, my kids do not, do not go to the doctor, but even, you know, backing up, I think that, um, something that's important to talk about is just like the empowering women to feel like their bodies are meant and designed for pregnancy mm -hmm. and birth. Because throughout those experiences with Ava and Jackson, I didn't feel like mine was. You know, I felt like I had to be in the medical system. I had to be in the hospital in order for me to have my child. And in that moment, there's always instances, right, where, where women are safer in the hospital setting. And for me with Ava, that was no, there was no question right. about that. But I do feel like our country has really medicalized birth where women don't feel like it's ours anymore right. and where it's something that we can do on our own. And that I think was the biggest difference in those two births versus Jada. Whereas at home, it's just, I don't even know how to describe the feeling. Like you are put in a space where you don't have medicine to rely on. Mm -hmm. And so you come back to this like innate, just feeling your DNA knows what to yes do. where your body knows what to do and where you can get through it safely mm -hmm. and I just like in terms of my patients it, home birth is not for everybody but I want women no matter where they give birth at home in a hospital in a, in a birth center wherever it is to know that your body is meant and designed to go through this mm -hmm. and that you can get through it and it's meant to heal and do it again exactly and that's, there's nothing wrong with medical intervention. I and mean, if, if you want, you know, um, just help through through labor mm -hmm. and you want that epidural, that is totally your choice. But know that it's a choice, yes. you know, not that it's needed to get through it, but that it is a choice for you there if you want it. Um, yeah, I don't think we'll talk about that enough. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, obviously, because you see pediatrics and kids all the time, and that's the, the majority of what you see. Yeah. Right. Um, Maybe 50, 50, 50 50 at this point. Yeah. So now having we can talk about that more. Yeah. Well, having moms in too, and and again, you have to be able to. You can't pour from an empty cup. Right. Right. So mom self care and having the resources and having that support and and doing all of those things and making sure that mom feels supported. Yeah. So she can support her babies. Yeah. and advocate for them so yes. we're going to help advocate for you yes so what are the questions that if knowing all that you know as a mama if you were having to go to another np what were the what would be the questions that you would ask of the np and what questions would you ask to the mp if i were pregnant or if, or if i for the baby like if a baby was born already um let's start with mom okay and like in the you know, in pregnancy. So number one sure, that's is I want <laughs> pregnancy. when the, when a the baby's in there, um, that is something that with this platform I've been focusing on, like in practice, I don't have time to, um, be as close to moms, pregnant women as I would like to be because our, my schedule just books out four to six weeks. And it's like, if you have a pregnant mom where you have to run, you know, labs every two weeks, it's yeah. just, you know, um, doesn't do well. So with the Discover Doc platform, that is the only clients that I've been taking one-on-one -on -one are either preconception or pregnant or postpartum moms, because it is so darn import important to optimize your health before pregnancy and then keep it optimal during pregnancy. Right. And looking at 
labs, like all that was looked at in my first two pregnancies were a CBC and a thyroid panel, you know, like what? Did like, they run a full thyroid where, panel? No, 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 no. It was just a TA, TSH. Um, you know, where is, where are the micronutrients? Where right. are, you know, other immune markers where, you know, there are so many other things that can be looked at to optimize you and your, the health of yourself, as well as the baby that you're growing that that is what the one-on-ones with the discovery doc is is focused on and running functional medicine laboratories so i wish back then i knew that or i asked just why and what else why is this going on and what else can be done and even if someone even if they said like i'm not sure (laughs) that at least would have put like planted a seed where i could go find alternatives or ask other people. So I just think that, but I was also young, you know, I was 25. So yes, but would you know if you had started your pregnancy journey later, you would have known if you had done the same, same exact thing, Mm -hmm. but at 28 instead of 21, would you have known 25, 25? Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) So that's a, I mean, even now at 38. I don't, I still don't know all the questions right. to ask or when I'm in the specialist office or the doctor's office, I always think of something later. So what I would have done in retrospect is because there's only, there's questions that you can ask that a normal OB or I shouldn't say normal conventional OB will say, no, this is good enough. You know? So I, in retrospect, what I would have done is I would have had my conventional OB and then I would have had a, either a naturopathic physician or a more holistic NP or some other provider who can come on the side and piggyback off of the OB's care, you know, where right. you're getting that conventional care, you're going for your ultrasounds and that, and then having a more in-depth look at my body before pregnancy and during pregnancy. And the questions I could have asked that person are, hey, what are comprehensive labs that I can do to make sure that I am staying as, as you know as healthy and as well as I can mm-hmm. throughout this pregnancy and so that I can heal the best postpartum. What are supplements that are safe to take that I can take to support detox pathways in pregnancy, to support methylation pathways, to support my liver, to support my gut during pregnancy and that are safe to take postpartum, not just my prenatal. Yeah. Those are things that that I I would have asked um in retrospect and things that I, I did essentially myself in the third pregnancy. I would have not have known to ask all those questions, but I'm going to write them all down and ask them when I get pregnant. <laughs> there we go. I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, that's just, that's a, if you're not in the world that we're in and I know to ask yeah. more questions because of my medical mystery of, Hey, what, you know, what for and what next mm-hmm. or what else? Um, but if you don't know, yeah, how would it, like, I don't know how to advocate for myself sometimes. Yeah. How am I going to advocate for a, a baby? Right. right. So, I think so that, how do you advocate for a baby in this whole process as well as a, as a newborn? Yes. I have two other things I just thought of that would be important are what are my options? So what are my, if I am groupie strep positive, what are my options? Do I have, you know, the, the conventional OB is going to say, Hey, you have to take an antibiotic and you'll need an, an IV antibiotic during labor and delivery. This practitioner over here, I could ask, what else can I do to potentially get rid of that? Um, or postpartum, hey, what can I do naturally to increase my breast milk supply, to decrease the chances of postpartum depression? Mm-hmm. You know, these are things that should be talked about and tools that are given prior to giving birth. Right. With the newborn, um, so something that we do at... Uh, my medical practice discovery wellness group is which I love are my newborn home visits. Um, so we will actually, it doesn't matter where moms give birth. I will take that first appointment. And instead of them having to put on a diaper and waddle to the car and put their baby in a, in an SUV and come to the doctor's office, I will actually come to them. Um, and we talk, and that's my chance to talk about mom. Mm-hmm. and how she's healing to get her on a good supplement regimen that's safe postpartum while breastfeeding where it doesn't step on the OB's toes or the midwife's toes right. or whoever they're dealing with. Um, 
And then for newborns, in that moment, I love chiropractic care in mm -hmm. the first week of life um, and craniosacral care because we forget that for the newborn, birth is traumatic too. Mm -hmm. And they can harbor a lot of that. Like our cells just remember that trauma and we can stay in that heightened state of fight or flight. So I love chiropractic care, especially if the baby's fussier or spitting up a lot. Yep. Um, there aren't really any any supplements that I suggest starting in the first, I mean, even six months of life, unless something's going on. Yeah. Um, but we are preventative in the sense that I want to know everything about the parents, every detail, so that I can best advise them moving forward. Mm -hmm. And future well visits, um, a big thing for me, obviously, is, is that preventative aspect, is if a kid is, you know, experiencing some sort of symptoms, okay, why? why are they experiencing that? I'm not just going to slap the medication right. on that kid and call it a day. Um, I also am a big proponent of medical freedom when it comes to your own health and your kid's health. And that's a huge controversial topic. Um, but for me, what it means is that at the end of the day, we are responsible for our own health. Mm -hmm. We are responsible for our child's health. And it's too often that we feel like somebody else is responsible for it. But I also don't think that society works in a way that empowers us to feel that way. Right. 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 So that's what I work to do is like, I want to sit down with you as the patient or this person as the, the mom or dad and just say, okay, what are your thoughts, beliefs? What would you like to do with your child? What educated decisions can we make together that's in the best interest of your kid? where I'm just not the end all to be all right. Like I'm not there to tell you what to do with your kid um, or what not to do. I want you to make that decision. If it is a drastic decision that may be harmful, I will challenge you. Absolutely. Um, but that to me is what medical freedom means is that you as a parent or you as a patient have the, have the power to make the decision for your family. Mm -hmm. Well, and you do that, that helpful thing too, of giving them all the information that they need on both sides Yes. or maybe not both sides, but no, to I make, agree. Yeah. To make I all agree. of the information, yeah. uh, make an informed decision and a well-educated decision yes. of this is what we're looking at. This is what happens. This is what's recommended or, mm -hmm. you know, you can make the choice either way. Um, I think that that's also a brilliant thing that you do yeah. in those well visits well care for, yes. for babies. And I'll tell patients this, you know, I have my own personal beliefs, but my own personal beliefs will never impede on your beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm not going to force you to think how I think. And I think too many doctors do that where, or, or nurse practitioners where this is what we're taught in school. This is what you have to do. And if you don't abide by this, bye, that to me is malpractice. How, right. how could I say bye to a patient or not allow a kid into my practice and then they're not getting care that to me is malpractice you right. know and it's so i do have to remain i do have to separate my personal opinions and medical quote opinions or or um suggestions because if i'm going to stand for medical freedom i need to stand for it on all sides mm -hmm. where i'm empowering you as a parent to make your decision whatever quote side that may be on. And I will support you in that way. And I'll do everything that I can to protect your child, to help your child's immune system, you know, be boosted up holistically. So no matter what they come across, they can fight it off better right. than the next. Um, or, you know, if it's something as simple as, Hey, they have strep throat, they went to urgent care, they they're taking an antibiotic. Okay. We're going to be over here protecting their gut health, you know, just, just being the equalizer so to speak. Brilliant. I am, aren't I? No, I'm, just are. I'm just kidding. She's I'm just kidding, guys. That's why she's the discovery doc. <laughs> I am just kidding. It's just my personal philosophy. And I wish that, you know, when, when Ava and Jackson were little, that I had that, it, like literally no, no doctor. And the doctors that we saw when Ava and Jackson were younger babies, it was, it's just cattle. Like they go in, they do mm -hmm. routine things and that's it. And it's just the same thing for every single kid. And it's like, one day the light switch went off in my head that was like, every kid is different. Genetics are different. Yeah. Methylation pathways are different. You know, we are, we cannot all handle the same thing. And I think that parents 
innately have a, a, as we do, you know, I think women, no offense, men, women have it a little bit more than men, but I think God gave us this innate ability to have a strong sense of what needs to be done. Yeah. And moms often are like bashed for trying to follow that instinct or told that you're going to harm your kid if you follow that instinct. And I'm over here like, no, mom, listen to that. If that is what your mommy instinct is telling you, I 100% agree. And that's what we need to do. Mommy's intuition is a powerful, powerful Oh my thing. gosh, it's so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we trans transition, I guess, between well care and then stepping into something that needs fun functional care, functional yeah. medicine? How do you determine that? So you've sat down with mom and dad, you've had the conversations, everything's good, but then these other things start popping up in more frequency mm -hmm. or something that they shouldn't be going on at, at a certain age. Yeah. Like how do you transition and equip mom and dad, of course, with all the information that you do have at the moment to say, Hey, this is how we, how we proceed for going to move forward with functional medicine. Yeah. And these are what has shown up for me. And you decide if you want to go down the functional path. So some things can stay within the well child realm. If I have a kid, you know, let's say I have a three month old that's spitting up a lot. Okay, we can go through, if the kid is only breastfed, we can go through what mom is eating that's triggering that kid. We can go through probiotics. We can go through, you know, different um, supplements that help to just equal out the, the acidity in the stomach. We can go through chiropractic, craniosacral, all that stuff. Oftentimes that will resolve. If it's something, like you said, that is becoming more chronic or say that I don't see them for, mm -hmm. you know, six months or something, and they come back and they're like, you know, he has just been constipated for six months and we were out of town and, you know, we saw a, an urgent care physician or we saw, you know, whoever, another PCP who put him on Miralax for four months and it worked. But then I took him off because I don't want him to be on Miralax. Then I'm like, hey, we need additional labs here. Now you're crossing more into the functional world. And that functional world are more in-depth labs that tell me the why why those things are going on. And then I develop protocols based on those labs. But we're going to save that <laughs> for yeah. another talk. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are going to talk about all things functional medicine in the next episode. And kind of like Anna Kate was saying, that liaison of linking well child to functional medicine, but also functional medicine for adults and what that looks like um, for adults who may be chronically ill. So stay tuned, y'all. Yep. So ask the questions and let's discover together.